Sponsored by Raycon. The entire world is a collection of memoranda that she did exist and that I have lost her. Oh, I have been looking forward to this one. Not the movie, obviously. What's worse than a terrible, angsty, deeply problematic romantic drama based on a Harry Styles fanfic written on Wattpad? A sequel to that drama! Just as Fifty Shades of Grey originated as a losty Twilight fanfiction, so too did After originate as a questionable self-insert about how much the author wants to gargle Harry's marbles, written entirely with one hand. For some unfathomable reason, this absolute dreck proved wildly popular, so writer Anna Todd turned her story into books, which then became movies. Really bad movies. I covered the first instalment in this god-awful franchise last year, and this has been one of my most requested videos since. You guys really hate me that much, huh? I see how it is. This is my curse, isn't it? To exist purely to suffer for your pleasure. Why are you still here? But before we go any further, ladies and gentlemen... It's that time again. Do you want to crank up the volume without annoying everyone in your house? Do you hate wired earphones as much as I do? Then you should bag yourself a pair of Raycon's premium wireless earbuds. Not only are they single-handedly keeping my channel above the poverty line, but given their comfortable, noise-isolating design, their ease of use via a Bluetooth connection, and the up to six hours of playtime you can get out of them, they've become my everyday go-to for listening to music while I'm doing chores, going out for walks, or chilling to atmospheric soundtracks while I read. He had time to write a history of the Targaryen Kings, but it's been ten years since Dance with Dragons. What are you doing, George? Their added bass gives their sound just a little more kick to it, and thanks to their design, they stand up to movement more so than any wired earphones I've ever owned. You can't really go wrong with a pair of these, and with a 45-day free return policy, what are you waiting for? Support the channel by clicking the link in the description or heading over to buyraycon.com slash cynicalreviews to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash cynicalreviews. Once again, link in the description and pinned comment. Add over. Alright, just to quickly get you up to speed, After follows bright-eyed cardboard cutout and author surrogate Tessa, who goes to university and falls for English bad boy and Harry Styles substitute Hardin Scott. Despite him being a complete asshole, she cheats on her boyfriend with him, and they proceed to have an incredibly mind-numbing and rocky relationship, before it's revealed that he seduced her as a bet with his friends. They break up, but the ending implies that they get back together, because of course they have to put out a second helping of this drivel. And if you thought I was going to have any positive feelings about a sequel to this story, then you haven't been paying attention. But not only did they fail to subvert my incredibly low expectations, but they somehow managed to make it worse. Yes, they made a worse version of Fifty Shades of Grey, and then they made that worse. How... how did you do that? I'm genuinely stunned. The author actually wrote the screenplay this time, which explains a lot. My last few videos were kind of serious, so this will be a nice change of pace. All joking aside, at least no one actually got hurt making this, you know? Look, I don't care about the movie's cinematography, or its editing, or any of the technical aspects, and let's be honest, neither do you. That sort of commentary is reserved for movies that give a single solid f what people like you or I think of them. We all know what this is. Trying to analyse this movie would be like trying to write a dissertation about a slice of bread. So this isn't really a review, this is more of a roast. I am just going to treat this movie with the same amount of respect that it showed to me. Oh boy, I can't wait to experience the continuing adventures of my favourite mismatched generic white couple since... Eh? And... Eh? And... Eh? Okay, it's a pretty low bar, but my hatred for this couple defies words. Usually I can't stand movies like Hostel, which are just about people getting tortured for 90 minutes, but you know what? Remake Hostel and put these two in it, and I'd watch that on repeat. They are both truly awful, insufferable, nauseating people, and they have what is probably the most stupid, toxic, and unsexy relationship that I've seen in one of these piece of sh romance movies. 
It seems like all they do is fight, break up, and do things that I can't say on YouTube because YouTube thinks we're all stupid children who can't even handle the mere mention of them. Their petty problems are entirely the result of misunderstandings or their immature, selfish behaviour. And the setups for these conflicts reach new heights of ridiculous contrivance. You thought the first movie was bad for convoluted scenarios? Well, just you wait. But they have to manufacture this idiotic drama in order to pad out the runtime, because this movie could have been five minutes long. Well, it could have been zero minutes long, but you can't have everything you want. Predictably, the movie is overly long, terribly paced, and boring, and ridden with more cliches than scars on a leper. And there's absolutely no stakes, because we know they're going to end up together in the end, because that's exactly what this genre is. And the author clearly had no interest in doing anything original with it. Of course they're not going to realise that they're not right for each other, because this story romanticises an awful relationship dynamic, and encourages its impressionable audience to stay with their bad boy despite them possessing more blatant red flags than a CCP parade. <sighs> I'm getting pretty sick of seeing these problematic relationships because there's only so many ways you can say that this isn't okay. This is meant to be a dumb fantasy that has no bearing on reality, which I guess is fine if you want to consume that sort of thing, whatever, but I can still call it stupid. But even for people who enjoy this sort of young adult romance, I genuinely do not understand the appeal of these characters. What is so enthralling about these individuals to justify wasting multiple hours of your life watching their emotional train wreck? Hardin still always looks like he's on the verge of pissing his pants, and Tessa wouldn't stand out in a room full of mayonnaise jars. I literally could not care less about these characters, and this film does nothing to change my mind. Watching After We Collided is like watching diarrhea circling a toilet bowl. A sludgy, poopy, predictable mess that ultimately goes nowhere. So let's go sifting through the nuggets, shall we? You know you want to. It's from Wattpad Studios, so, so you know it's good. Hardin wastes no time letting us know how obsessed he is with Tessa. Whatever our souls are made of, hers and mine are the same. And then gives us a quick rundown of prior events. Why even bother giving us this flashback? Anyone who's actually going to care about this is already going to have the book open in one hand and a greasy cucumber in the other. Still not over her, Hardin mopes around like a little bitch before getting what I think might be one of the worst tattoos I've ever seen. The kind of thing a teenage girl would draw on her arms in Byro. But while he's getting accosted by homeless people, Tessa is living the high life as only a privileged white girl in a teen romance can. Because we wouldn't want anything to be too challenging for her, she's managed to secure a paid internship at a publishing company, despite this being what I think is still her first year of university. Although it was based on nepotism, so I guess that's somewhat realistic. Here she meets Trevor, the only decent character. Although he does look like a YouTuber I'd expect to see make an apology video entitled Holding Myself Accountable. Despite this, he's actually nice, smart, and funny. Everything that Hardin isn't. And of course, he and Tessa have way more genuine chemistry than she has with Hardin. But Hardin's British, so I guess that balances out? And we have to have some arbitrary conflict that will eventually get resolved when she goes back to Mr. Wrong. Anyway, she reads and reports on three manuscripts in one night, and then has a stroke. Oh, no, she's just asleep. What a shame. Her boss is so impressed by this that he immediately invites her to a publishing conference, which is just an excuse for a party. And she gets an upgraded suite at the hotel, because of course she does. And the boss's assistant buys her new clothes, yada yada. When does any of this ever happen? How am I supposed to take any of this seriously? I can't believe I've been a Vance for only a day. Yeah, I can't believe it either, but here we are. Meanwhile, Hardin goes to a party with those side characters from the first movie that we didn't care about either, and continues to act like a petulant dickhead. So what books have you written? Oh, this and that. After a cameo from the author less subtle than a brick to the face, Tessa dances like only the plainest white girl can. She meets a hot stud, but continues to fantasize about Christian milk toast. She gets wasted and drunk dials him, basically slutting it up in order to torment him. I'm not wearing any underwear! <laughs> oh yeah, she's not wearing any underwear for some weird reason? We forgot to buy you underwear, but my clothes are at the laundry. I guess they needed him to be able to follow the scent of her sweaty love tunnel, because he then somehow tracks her down. He says he has her location, which is fucking weird. 
But how does he know where her room is? Did her employers or the hotel tell him? Because that's grossly irresponsible if so. She took Trevor back to her room purely for friendly reasons, but then she does an oopsie, so he has to get undressed. And all of these ridiculous contrivances are needed so that they can have this equally ridiculous confrontation. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Oh, watch out, guys, we got a badass over here. Look, Harden, I think this is a missile. Oh. God, he is such an asshole. So they have a big fight where he tries to control her and she torments him with her uh, sexiness. And then she fills him up and they do things. I'm not the one taking advantage of drunk girls. And then he does things with her, knowing that she's drunk. Amazing. These scenes are utterly cringe, but why would you expect any different? He falls asleep on her butt, which is very dangerous after a night of drinking, let me tell you. She gets some post-nut clarity, so they break up again. And they have a massive argument where they act like the most insufferable douchebags. I didn't know what I was doing from kissing that guy to... What? Yeah, well, when you were kissing that guy, I was f***ing Molly. Marvellous. I am so invested in these characters now, I cannot wait to see them die. Tessa goes back to the apartment where she squatted with Hardin, because that's exactly what they were doing. She talks about blocking him and moving on, which would be the sensible thing to do, but she can't seem to stop herself from fantasising about him. Now, Trevor had already sorted out a car for her after she complained about spending too much money on Ubers, which is just another example of how every problem she has gets very quickly resolved, thus ruining any tension. Trevor respected her and helped her to become more independent, while Hardin made her totally reliant on him. So by siding with Hardin, she's being a fucking idiot, and I have no sympathy for her. But of course, she starts cleaning his apartment like a good trad wife. Thanks for setting the women's rights movement back several decades. Then Hardin and his British mum show up. And because Hardin hasn't told his mum that they broke up, they decide to play along and deceive her. Because neither of them has the balls to be honest, and we need another arbitrary factor forcing them together. He makes his mum sleep on the sofa after she's just flown across the Atlantic and the entire North American continent, the turd. They're like, well, we have to sleep in the same bed, but we're not going to have sex. We're not Neanderthals. <laughs> and then they do things. And it goes on for a while. She goes home to the wet blanket boyfriend she cucked in the first movie. Her dad tried to come back and see her, but her mum chased him off. So Tessa gets pissed, refuses to stay at home, and ends up back at Hardin's place. It's another blatant contrivance to force these two together like a square peg in a round hole. On the plus side, we do get to see Hardin in pain, which was a personal highlight. He goes to her yoga class, but it's just an excuse for them to get physical again, as if they needed an excuse. Then they jump in the shower for a steamy session. That sound you're hearing isn't the shower. They held the microphone up to the author's minge. She gets called into work and has to look after her boss's son, Smith, who looks like a serial killer in the making. But hey, if Smith were my first name, I'd want to kill people too. I don't give a fuck what people think. Which people don't you have a fuck about? Oh shit, don't say fuck. Shit. Because we haven't seen this before in every babysitting movie ever. Who cares if he knows bad words? His name is Smith, the damage is done. And once again, this scene is completely inconsequential. They stay in her office after hours and... Well, what do you think? This was reportedly one of the author's favourite scenes. <laughs> what a shock. They've still not resolved him telling Tessa that he f***ed Pinky McSlotface. He never apologises and she never seems to hold it against him. It's just never addressed? They go to Hardin's dad's house for a Christmas party. And naturally, Hardin cannot resist the urge to get drunk, make a scene and act like a complete jackass. Tessa talks to Trevor, who's now taken on the role of the gay best friend, even though he's not gay. Anyhow, Trevor announces that he's moving to Seattle because he's got a job there. And of course, the manuscript that she recommended got sold for loads of money. So her boss offers to pay her rent and tuition to work for him, and pay for her to move to Seattle. Which is a dream opportunity for her, especially in this economy. But they're forcing her to choose between having an amazing career handed to her on a silver platter, and Accent Boy. Guess which one she goes with? The answer might surprise you. No, it won't. It really won't. Because we haven't had enough cliches yet, they go to another house party. 
He meets some girl that he knows but we haven't seen before, and they go upstairs together, which is dodgy as fu- Skanky girl, I can't even be asked to look up her name, insults Tessa so she stays longer just to spite her. So they play truth or dare again, like real mature people do. Is it true that you're a dumbass for getting back together with Harden after he clearly fucked you for a bet? You know what? I take back everything I ever said about this girl. She is now my favourite character. Usually I have to pay to see this kind of action. So they go upstairs and yeah, yeah, they, they do it again. But the best part is, and I swear I'm not making this up, they climax at the stroke of midnight. I got nothing. I got nothing. Like, wh what can I even say to this? It, it goes beyond parody. It's like they were trying to upset me. While she's in the bathroom, he sees texts on her phone from Trevor. Instead of asking her about it, he runs off to talk to the other girl in order to make Tessa jealous. So then she kisses some random guy in front of him. You see how contrived and ridiculous this is? They both feed into each other's misunderstandings and act like hypocritical assholes. Dude! You do. Oh, and we're supposed to be rooting for these people? So they break up again. She gets distracted by Hardin calling her and gets killed in a car accident. The end. Except no, she's still alive. God fucking damn it. Hardin calls her, but Trevor picks up and basically tells him to fuck off. Absolutely based. She suffers no lasting consequences from the crash, of course. He f***s off back to Accent Land after writing her a letter in which he admits they're not right for each other and they should move on, etc, etc, but it's all going to be rendered meaningless in about five minutes after his mum offers some absolutely terrible and cliched advice. I love you, but you have to start fighting for what really matters. Bitch, why are you enabling this nonsense? There's another party at the house of Tessa's boss. He proposes to his assistant because we were dying to know how that riveting subplot got resolved. Trevor admits to Tessa that he told Hardin to f*** off, and then he wanders off. Probably to rub one out while her scent is still in his nostrils. And who shows up at the party but Hardin? You're just never gonna leave me alone, are you? You, you are aware that that's not a good thing, right? Clearly not, because she's like, get in, and so Trevor gets cucked. Then the homeless man shows up again right at the end, and it turns out that it's her dad. Yeah, that's the note they end this on. To sum this all up, After We Collided is a complete waste of the potential that it never possessed in the first place. Besides being insufferable, it is completely bland, unoriginal, and boring, and leaves you with nothing more than a sour taste in your mouth and the desire to launch a class action lawsuit for your wasted time. And just like that turd that refuses to flush, this franchise refuses to just fuck off. Because there are not one, but two movies that have already been filmed, one of which is due to be released this year. You know what? Bring it on. If they're gonna milk that teat for all it's worth, then I'm gonna milk that teat for all it's worth. I am now locked in a life or death struggle with shitty Wattpad adaptations. How did my life come to this? I have two degrees. They're both fucking useless, but still. Well, I gotta pay the rent and buy more 40k models. So yeah, bring it on. Thanks for watching folks, if you liked the video do give it a like and a share and all that good stuff. If you want to support the channel do check out the sponsor Raycon, link in the description once again, or pick up some merch over on Bonfire. You can also become a YouTube channel member or a patron on Patreon. Patrons and channel members get early access to uncensored versions of videos without ads or sponsorships as well as a mention here in the credits. I stream on Twitch every Sunday so follow me at twitch.tv slash cynicalreviewsofficial if you're interested in that. Join my public Discord server and follow me on social media if you want to stay up to date, and I'll see you in the next one.